Okay, well, thanks, Lorena. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Does it sound like hearing a talk through a drive through That's been my joke this term, right? Okay. All right. Okay, so um, I guess I'll get this thing going here. I've never used two screens before. I'm feeling pretty official. Okay. So I'd just like to, uh, to recognize the fact that we're on Treaty 4 territory and homeland of the Cree. I won't get into the details. I'll save that actually for a couple minutes. Okay. So just as a little bit of background, okay, I don't know if everyone knows, I was kind of surprised back in 2018 when Jane Philpott, Minister of the Trudeau government, admitted that there was an 18 year life expectancy difference between Indigenous Canadians and the rest of us. Like, holy hell, okay, that's a, that is a huge difference in life expectancy. So you can see here, this is, uh, oh, and, and I'll give you guys a heads up. Most of these images or most of these uh, lines are taken from newspapers and that because it's really a current event story. So that's, that's what's going on with all those numbers and dates and that kind of thing, okay? So we know as, as health researchers, as, as people in the health business, I guess, that, that there's, there are gaps and we're, I guess we're supposed to be trying to address them. And, okay, in these crazy days of COVID where I'm giving a talk wearing a mask and everybody else is all masked up, health authorities, indigenous health authorities and non-indigenous health authorities are doing their best, are beating the bushes to really try to, to encourage I indigenous people to get vaccinated. You can see here, this is your shot. If you were a member of the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan when you got vaccinated, you had the opportunity to win a truck. Somebody won the truck, I'm not sure who it was, but right now you, can, like, you have the ability to win an awesome looking skidoo. You can see over on the, uh, on the bottom right there, VaxFest, that was basically a music festival for young people to encourage them to get vaccinated at Meadow Lake Tribal Council where I think they were having trouble getting uh, vaccination rates over, it was under 50%. I think they're over 50% now. And I don't have any direct, uh, any uh, specific numbers because they're always changing. Like, you know, the, the numbers I have are a couple months old. The one on top is Saskatoon Tribal Council. So even everybody is working on this and still, you know, like there, there's hesitancy and, you know, I wanted to put on like, why don't people just listen to reason? A lot of us in the health field have just been talking about like, it's so obvious. Well, what I want to share with you is maybe not. So I'm going to kind of break my, my talk into two different parts. Being a historian, I'm going to tell you guys some stories from the olden days. Okay. And I, I just want to talk to you about how in the past indigenous people have been, um, have been very receptive to vaccination. And, and we'll talk about that. But also how, I don't know, the relationship between Canada and, and Indigenous people has gone so far sideways that I think that's really what the, uh, you know, what, what one of the central factors is. Oh, another thing is, some of you guys may know this, I love showing growth slides. Here's one. Okay. What I'm going to tell you guys about is smallpox. And really this is, I don't know, kind of like the, uh, the central theme of a lot of my work. We haven't really, many, many of you folks weren't even alive when smallpox was eradicated back in 1980, but smallpox was the most deadly disease in human history, okay? I, as you can see here, may have killed half a billion people over the course of the, the first 75 years of the 20th century, okay? So super deadly, even, even in communities that had endemic smallpox, something like 30% of the people could have died of those diseases. Also, because I'm interested in the, um, in the spread of smallpox to Turtle Island, to America, whatever you might want to call it, uh, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called a virgin soil epidemic. And I guess we're in kind of a virgin soil epidemic for COVID, right? In fact, we were all exposed to it. And potentially 80% of the population could die in the span of maybe three weeks. And the, and the survivors at 20% has just survived the most deadly disease in human history, so they probably can't move. So early chroniclers of, of epidemics like recorded famines and stuff like that because people weren't able to access food in the aftermath of basically this apocalyptic event. And you know, when I, when I talk about this to my first years, right, they're all freaking out for a minute, but like smallpox has been eradicated. And this is one of the great, I don't know, medical victories of the 20th century. And really it's a victory of vaccination. We know, well, we know for a whole bunch of different reasons, but even in the mid 18th century, indigenous nations, you can see here Dakota winter counts. The Dakota people who lived sort of along the 49th parallel, 
had a written record of their history. And what they did was, on teepees, okay, they would, they would have a pictograph such as these of the most important event that happened that year. So you can see here, and, and those histories go back three, four hundred years in some cases. So you can see here, this is from uh, 1734, 35. Basically what that represents is a virgin soil epidemic of smallpox. And same thing over on the, uh, on the right. So there, even in the 18th century, sometimes even before Europeans showed up, there were massive changes, massive demographic changes, territorial changes, uh, and like I said, uh, you know, um, huge, dem like I said, huge demographic events. I want to share with you just a couple of, uh, uh, I don't know, a couple of thoughts about the virgin soil epidemic that hit our territory, Treaty 4, okay? This is uh, from my friend Paul Hackett's book, and you can see, basically, you've got a pandemic that spreads from Mexico City, actually went all the way down into South America, and I think 150,000 people in documented cases. So this would be people in communities that had somebody to, you know, basically count the deaths. But went all the way to eastern seaboard and basically to uh, almost to the Arctic Ocean in, in the Northwest Territories, okay? So this was a pivotal event, and I'll show you guys in a second. It was also, a piv like to Indigenous people, but also it was, it was uh, a, a crucial event in the American Revolution. You can see uh, my, my friend Elizabeth Fenn wrote a book called Pox Americana. And what she showed was the, the American Revolution took place during this huge smallpox epidemic. They call it the Great Epidemic. And the Continental Troops, the guys in blue, so those are the people who eventually became the Americans, fighting against the guys in red, the British, the Loyalists. The Americans experimented with a, a, a procedure called inoculation. Inoculation had been practiced in China for probably thousands of years. And what it entailed was taking a scab from someone who had smallpox, cutting the skin with a piece of glass or something like that, sticking the scab in, and basically purposely infecting the patient, if you want to call him that. And you can see this is like a, a Chinese rendition of what's going on. Because the Continental Army under, like, undertook that procedure during this, you know, the context of this big epidemic, they were able to field more soldiers than the redcoats were. And that's what Elizabeth Fenn argued is that's one of the main reasons why, you know, uh, England lost that colony was because of medical intervention. At the same time, for our own purposes, okay, that was a virgin soil epidemic in this territory. I think I mentioned that to you guys. The epidemic took place a few years after basically Europeans had occupied a a few dozen, maybe a couple hundred Europeans occupied this, this territory uh, pursuing the fur trade. So one of, my, one of my job hazards as a historian is reading basically the daily journals of these fur traders. And the fur traders were, were in this territory. Actually, they were more like around Saskatoon, or, you know, like North Saskatchewan River. And what they found was prior to this epidemic, they had several different individual nations identified the Pigogamau, the Kawanatau, the Basquia. Like they identify them as distinct communities. When, the, when basically the virus arrived in this territory, there was so much turmoil and so much death that was recorded by the, by the fur traders. Some communities disappeared for two or three years, but other communities, as kind of the dust settled from, from the epidemic and the mortality and everything else, survivors came together and what they did was, after the epidemic, the fur traders uh, refer to them as the Plains Cree. And you can see the Nehiyoak, or a different pronunciation, okay? So we acknowledge their territory, but it, this is basically a group that was, how would I say, shaped by this epidemic, okay? So super important event in the, in the history of Saskatchewan, in the history of indigenous Saskatchewan, for sure. So that's the 1780s, uh, 1780s. like I said, uh, uh, a couple years later, okay, just sort of in the aftermath of this huge epidemic, Edward Jenner becomes probably the most influential physician in Western medicine, right? He is super highly uh, regarded for basically uh, a, his experiment on his gardener's son. And I, like, I don't know how things went down with the gardener's son. Like, I'll give you a bonus if you let me experiment on your child, but, okay? The idea is, is that Jenner knew 
that you can see this painting by Vermeer, the milkmaid. Okay, now she's portrayed as you know being I don't know you know pretty and, and doing her thing. Milkmaids at this time were considered to be the most beautiful women, sort of in society. The reason being is that milkmaids who are milking the cows, doing their thing, are getting cowpox, a relative, a disease, a, a virus that's a relative of smallpox. They're get, you know they're getting pox kind of like chicken pox, but then they're recovering and their complexions are clear. Okay? In contrast to the rest of society, which would have had smallpox and probably would have been scarred up. Okay? So there's a coral, Jenner knows that the, that, you know, the milkmaids are immune, or he's, he wants to know if the milkmaids are immune to smallpox. So what he does was he infects a kid with cowpox. Okay? And that's basically two guys harvesting cowpox lymph in the 19th century, like an early photograph of it. He infects the kid with cowpox. And then he exposes the kid to, to smallpox, and the kid's immune. Okay, that is one of the biggest medical breakthroughs, like you know, the cornerstone of virology, probably of modern medicine. So, from the 1790s on, okay, and I've been working on, you know, so I'm, I'm working on a manuscript, and, and the early chapters, and I'm blown away by how quickly this phenomenon was globalized. Okay, uh, I think 1802, there was a vaccination commissioner in India, China. Uh, Red River, the early Red River colony that became Winnipeg, had vaccination under, like, underway as the first settlers were coming to the colony in the 1810s. So very early on, people recognized you know, the, the potency of, of vaccination against this you know, terrible disease. Now, a okay, couple different images here. We think of, many you guys have ever seen any cheesy cowboy movies, and you see the wagon trains heading west. What I'd like you to do is change your, your, your mind a little bit. And for the first several generations, probably until the 1840s, there weren't that many wagon trains. Where people came was on steamboats. Okay? So the occupation of, say, the central plains in the United States was actually undertaken by motorized boats. Like We're talking industrial revolution. Traveling pretty fast and occupying, like I said, Iowa into the, like along the Missouri River. Not surprisingly, with that level of transportation, there was an epidemic that broke up. So early in, very early on in the 1830s, okay? and uh, not surprisingly, there was terrible you know, death and destruction among the indigenous societies of the lower Missouri. In, um, in response to that level of, of, uh, of, of death and suffering, the American government basically um, provided the resources for a bunch of vaccinators to travel up the Missouri River. Okay? vaccinating everyone they could, including the Lakota. If you guys remember, the Lakota are part of our territorial acknowledgement. The Lakota people, or actually Sitting Bull, famous chief, who is, uh, I guess, the ancestor of the folks at Wood Mountain down in the southwest, okay? Those are Lakota people who were vaccinated in the 1830s. Now, that uh, rather odd-looking gentleman over there is Lewis Cass. At the time, he was the Secretary of War for the United States. He became a senator. He was a representative of Michigan. And what he, uh, like his decision, okay, caused the deaths of probably 15, 17,000 people because we decided was the vaccinators can only operate in the territory that we have ultimate control of. He didn't allow the vaccinators to proceed in, to the upper Missouri River. So, not surprisingly, okay, 1837, okay, this is Fort Union. You can drive to Fort Union on the Missouri River, I think in about two and a half or three hours from here. It's actually not that far. This was an American fur trade uh, center of, of the Northern Great Plains. And it was serviced by a steamboat. In this case, a steamboat called the St. Peter's. As the St. Peter's came in the spring of 1837, okay, there was a guy, on, at least one person on, on board who was sick with smallpox. As it happened, okay, the Assiniboine Nakoda people, again, the Nakoda are in our territorial recognition, okay, the Nakoda people had gathered there kind of for a summer gathering to marry off their children, do what they had to do, and trade with the Americans. The Americans, as this epidemic broke out, as it spread from the boat to the, to the fort, to the thousands of people who gathered to trade and do their thing, there was no doctor. In fact, it, it would be funny if it weren't so sick. In, their, in, the, uh, in the records, they had Dr. Thomas's medical book. Okay? So there are thousands of people dying around them, 
Okay, this is a pivotal event in the history of the Nakoda people. These fur traders are looking in a book and trying to figure out, by a book, how to do inoculation. Okay, and one of the things, inoculation is good for an individual. Okay, you might get sick, barf your guts out once you're inoculated, but you're infectious. Okay, so what might be good for an individual may not be good at, at a community level. So, all hell broke loose at Fort Union, okay, and so it undermined the Nakota population, we'll talk about that in a second, and that image over on the right is the Mandan people. Some of you guys may have gone on a beer run in your younger days to Mandan. Those communities were 800 years old, okay? The epidemic in 1837 was really like the, the death knell. So many people died in those communities that within a year or two, the Dakota basically overran them. And, and that was the end, kind of the end of their society. In contrast to all of this turmoil, a Hudson's Bay Company trader, who was a physician, Dr. William Todd, okay, heard that something had broken out. Like somebody came back, you know, and up around Fort Pelly, so not too far from, I guess, Yorkton, Melville, that kind of area. And what he did was, he personally vaccinated literally thousands of people. He also gave vaccine to indigenous people who are going to their communities, okay? So not only did he vaccinate, he provided vaccine, like I said, for others and then and education and a whole bunch of things. The, after, the, the outcome of that is a change in territorial occupancy, okay? You can see before, and I apologize for, I don't know, kind of the, the shiny images here, Check out the Assiniboine. That's the territory occupied by the Nakoda, okay? Oh, I'm sure everyone here has driven from Regina to Winnipeg. You cross the Assiniboine River, I don't know how many bazillion times, okay? The Assiniboine River is a reminder of the people who own that land, okay? These days, okay, <laughs> Harry the Kettle is an Assiniboine, is a Nakoda reserve, okay? So uh, the community that used to basically control the area between here and, and, uh, and the forks at the Red River is now, you know, like a, a shadow of itself because they underwent that, the pressure from that, uh, from that outbreak in the states. In contrast, you got the expansion of the territory of the Anishinaabe, okay, the Soto, okay, who were vaccinated by Buck, Dr. Todd and the Hudson's Bay Company, as were the Nehiao Cree. So when it came time, actually, before that, okay, this is, a, this is a, a basically a directive to, to Hudson's Bay Company traders just after the epidemic. And you guys can all read, but I underlined it. But what it represents is, these are all kind of uh, highbrow people in London, the, you know, the board of governors of the Hudson's Bay Company. <laughs> and what they're saying is, we've got to vaccinate people but we also think we want to vaccinate the ones who frequent the establishments with a view to the welfare of our business, okay? So vaccination, which saved thousands of lives, was as much a business decision as it was a humanitarian. Like these guys are talking in humanitarian principles in the 1830s in England was like a high water mark of like humanitarianism in the British Empire. But also what they're doing is they're vaccinating the people who are making them rich, okay? So that they're, they're, they're protecting their nest egg, okay? So, uh, like I said, Hudson's Bay Company is acting, but it's acting partially in its own best interest. Just as a little bit of context, okay, 1853, okay, uh, smallpox and vaccination, like I said, uh, was an important enough procedure that for about 20 years, maybe 30 years, it became law in England. So you can see here, Compulsory Vaccination Act, every child born in England during a period from the early 1850s, probably to 1870, was mandated by law to be vaccinated. Of course, not surprisingly, I've got a little note to myself, immediately followed by the first anti-vax movement, right? As soon as you have compulsion like that, you're gonna get people pushing back. And I don't know if you guys can see this over in the cheap seats, but this is kind of a political cartoon uh, pushing back on the cowpox vaccination. You see cows popping up on people's arms and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and a small, like, a small group of anti-vaccination activists, I guess, okay, we're very concerned about putting matter from another species into their own bodies, okay? But like I said, okay, uh, with regard to, say, the Hudson's Bay Company, who was, who was I guess, the only Western uh, institution representing the British Empire. There were indigenous institutions for sure, okay? 
what I've been looking at, and, and I've been following the, the, um, the history of smallpox and vaccination and I guess demographics on the West Coast. So here's something that I've just been working on. In 1853, and this is probably sparked by the California Gold Rush. The California Gold Rush was, in, like, was an insane genocidal, like <laughs> as beautiful and you know, like, uh, ideal, idealized as California is, they have one of the ugliest, most brutal histories in all of North America. With that kind of turmoil and the arrival of like literally hundreds of thousands of desperados, not surprisingly, you got an outbreak of disease. So what I've been doing is I've been following this outbreak of smallpox, Arizona, California, Oregon, Washington, and because there was so much transportation between Hawaii and the West Coast, it also broke out with a virgin soil epidemic in, uh, in Hawaii. Interestingly, the territory that I'm looking at, Vancouver Island, which had become a, a British colony in 1849, James Douglas is the governor, and he's writing his report, and he's like, oh yeah, as a precaution, okay, I just vaccinated everybody in the colony. Okay, no big deal. So, this, the American, uh, I guess, manifestation of this outbreak changed the demographic structure. So in, um, around Seattle, okay, the indigenous population became the minority. Along the west coast in the areas that were hit, settlers became the majority, and then there was, a, you know, like a whole bunch of fallout from that. But look at this, right? The colony have generally been vaccinated. William Tomey was a, was a physician that worked at Fort Nisqually, a Hudson's Bay post south of the 49th. He's at Cowichan, and Cowichan is just north of, um, of Victoria. I don't know what a trawler is, but that's what he called them, okay? So it's a bunch of people around Cowichan, crowded about, praying to be vaccinated, and giving a salmon for the privilege, okay? So from the documents, okay, and the reason why Governor Douglas is, is vaccinating everybody, just as a matter of course, they're doing all the work, okay? Like they're, they're, they're growing the food, they're providing all. So again, they're, they're providing humanitarian assistance, but you know, like they need them around, okay? In contrast, okay, and, and I guess this, uh, this will be later, a little later on in the manuscript I'm writing, okay? In contrast to after the Hudson's Bay Company is responsible, and this is during the, um, the, the Fraser River Gold Rush, I think it was 1860, well it was 1862, so there are probably 20,000 white men who had to buy their gold mining licenses in Victoria, okay? So that the labor of indigenous people was not required to the same level as it was 10 years earlier. Look at what happens, okay? So this is basically the population trend, and you can see that line just dropping off, okay? That is the, the mortality or the population declining, okay, over the summer, the summer of 1862. Now in looking at the, the responses, you can see 20,000 deaths, okay? Insane amount of people dying. Only people, say the Lekwungen people who had a small treaty around Victoria and Nanaimo and um, oh, Port Rupert, which is on the north end of the island, there was a coal mine there, they were vaccinated, okay? And 500 Christians in a colony further north, okay? There was a, a Christian, uh, actually William Duncan, Duncan BC is named after him, writes to the doctor, he's like, hey, can I have 500 vaccines for my Christians? And no problem. But in the meantime, any, anyone else was out of luck. Now this wasn't, uh, this wasn't organic, I guess that's the way to say it, because in Russia and Alaska, as soon as they heard about it, they vaccinated everybody. And in Washington state, it wasn't, it, it did, you know, didn't really cause that much of, of, a, of a public health issue because there was preemptive vaccination. So we've got all of these different, whoop, I just pulled the plug on something, didn't I? Is that the one? Oh, okay. First time to have technical difficulties. I stepped on a cord. There you go. Thank you. I'll, tr I'll try to keep with those. Okay, so you're seeing how how there's, there's a, a, you know, like a proactive response. There's sometimes there's a, a selective response. The last of the big smallpox epidemic that hit this territory, and I apologize for all these words, I just cut and pasted this from the, uh, from, uh, the museum. Uh, and you can see Richard Hardesty is a fur trader. So in, in the winter of 1869-70, as Canada is occupying Red River, Louis L is getting famous for the first time, there's a smallpox outbreak that spreads from Montana to Alberta, into, into Saskatchewan. More than 3,500 people died. 
Okay? Hudson's Bay Company did what they could, although they didn't have much medicine and people were actually like dying, people were picketing uh, some of the Hudson's Bay Post. Missionaries did what they could. Nisbet, you guys may know Nisbet Forrest from, um, from Prince Albert. He vaccinated several hundred people, okay? Uh, one, of the, one of the chiefs that was really influenced by this was the chief whose English name is Sweetgrass, and that's his image over there. Sweetgrass converted to, to Roman Catholicism and was vaccinated during this epidemic. So uh, there's a lot of controversy about Sweetgrass's legacy, I guess you could say, because some people consider him to be a sellout. He was one of the chiefs that invited the Canadians to come and, uh, and basically to set up, uh, to, set, to, to negotiate treaties. In his, in his invitation, he's like, we have been suffering from smallpox, so when you guys come, bring your medicine, okay? So, he, like I said, this was a traumatic enough event for everyone that in the, in the negotiations and in the terms of Treaty 6, there's a basically a guarantee of medicine, okay? And the medicine chest, okay, you could literally count the number of physicians on one hand in Western Canada at this time. Where the medical intervention was, was probably a mason jar with smallpox in it, right? So that, people have been arguing about this for 150 years, but really, okay, the medicine chest, that's all it says. And again, like I said, I got a little note to myself, that's probably the state of the art. Now, the crown commits itself to vaccination or medicine chest, so, over the course of, of 18, a couple of years, 1877 to 1880, there's a liberal physician. It's important that he's a liberal because it was a liberal government and everything ran on patronage. Dr. Haggerty literally vaccinated probably 10,000 people, indigenous people, traveled to reserves. And his work was, was, uh, was very important to me because he's vaccinating at the same time people are getting sick with other diseases from malnutrition. And he's actually writing in his, in his reports, I don't have any food. All I got is medicine, right? I can give him medicine, but I can't give him food. So, okay, Canada in the treaties makes a promise, like I said, I think of vaccination, and they undertake that promise. So, okay, the conclusion of the first part of my talk, for about a century, smallpox and vaccination truly f like created the, the ethnic map, the territorial map that we recognize you know, when we, when we acknowledge, you know, uh, territorial occupancy. Also, with, with a few exceptions, not every single person, okay, Indigenous people knew the value of vaccine, wanted vaccine, and would pay for it, or would protest if they didn't have access to vaccine, okay? And another crazy thing, okay, that promise was carried out, and there were no great smallpox epidemics that happened after that, of course, Right after that, right after tuberculosis, uh, you know, uh, broke out almost at community-wide levels. So what the heck went, like, okay, what went wrong? Where do I start? Okay, like, what didn't, what, what went right? One of the things I want to tell you, and we all know about the legacy of residential schools, that number over there kind of blows me away. A soldier who volunteered for World War II had a better chance of coming home than a kid did of going to residential school. Holy hell, okay? Uh, I want to bring your attention to that document up top. That is a pass. So from 1885 all the way to the 1950s, and I'm, uh, well, I got your attention, okay? There was a pass system that was basically imposed on First Nations people in Western Canada. I got this image from the Canadian Human Rights Museum. We are pretty judgy on South Africa, right? So this is an image from 1956, a demonstration, African women. Women don't want passes. With passes, we are slaves. The same year is this document. And this is a document. It's basically a correspondence that goes on between the Indian Affairs Manager, superintendent, something or other, okay, and, a, and somebody running a museum display. And they would like some indigenous people to give some cred to their diorama, okay? So it's back and forth. And you can see here, Permission is therefore given for them to be absent from their reserve from July 3rd to the 8th inclusive. 1956, a white dude is giving people permission to leave their reserve for five days. Okay. By the way, that one wasn't in the Canadian Human Rights Museum, right? Like. Okay. I'm telling you about the past system, and I won't dwell on it for too long. This is a correspondence between two very high-ranking government officials. One at the Department of Indian Affairs and the other one in the Department of Health. 
I'm, and I apologize for too many words. I, I cut and pasted it as an image. I couldn't edit it. If the Indians were not segregated on reservations, we should be compelled to take better care of them for our own protection. So the caste system is imposed on First Nations people because there is so much disease within those communities that if they were allowed free travel, they would be a threat to our ancestors, those of us who aren't indigenous. Now, just putting this into context, like I said, how things went wrong, okay? This is basically a population chart of, of Saskatchewan. Went up like a rocket until 1920, and then the Dust Bowl and the Depression hit. And if you guys remember back in the golden days of 2013, Saskatchewan's population in 2013 surpassed its population in like 1920 or something like that. So in contrast to the rest of, the, like the rest of Canada doubling and tripling its population, we're just really at what it was back in 1920. Now, the suffering that came with the Dust Bowl and the Depression is legendary, mythic, heroic. Anybody whose family is from here will hear all kinds of stories. Now, what I want to get across to you guys is, out of the crucible of this suffering, we had the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. Tommy Douglas, we'll see we'll with Tommy Douglas in a minute. Everybody in the province is broke. Literally hundreds of thousands of people abandoned Saskatchewan never to come back. Tommy Douglas and the CCF had a Christian vision for governance. You can see, and this is kind of a, I'm not a paid endorser for the NDP, okay? But you can see here, prosperity, justice, democracy, unity, equality, freedom, security. Everybody's broke. So basically, Douglas was saying, why don't we cooperate rather than compete? So, Douglas, about 10, 12 years ago, was voted the greatest Canadian, essentially, for setting up Medicare. This is one of his statements. And like I said, he's a Baptist minister, I think, and uh, he's trying to run a government on Christian principles, right? How we look after ourselves, not, you know, not, uh, you know, like how we look after others is the most important thing. So Douglas becomes, like I said, the greatest Canadian for basically setting up the Medicare system or the pilot project in Swift Current, right? They're super proud of this. Now, we should be proud of this, except for the fact that if you were an Indian, in the old school terminology, you weren't eligible for Tommy Douglas's medical, Medicare experiment. There was a institutionalized, segregated system of medicine. So on one hand, we've got this precursor to the modern Canadian state, and on the other hand, we've got the establishment of segregated, specialized, they were called Indian hospitals, because it was 1950, and so, okay, if you were, actually, I've got a friend that worked with my dad, Andy Ferries, he passed away a few years ago. I used to, when I go, would go to Moosonee, we'd hang out, eat tomato soup, he'd tell me stories. And one time, and so he's from an old Cree family, his dad was Hudson's Bay ship captain and all this stuff. And one day he said, oh, I'm not an Indian. I'm like, uh, Andy, I'm only 23, but like, to me, like you're pretty Cree. He said, no, I, I'm, I'm a veteran of World War II. And because of that, in the 50s, my wife was sick, I enfranchised. I gave up my Indian status and became a citizen so my wife wouldn't go to the Indian hospital, so she could go, he didn't say to the real hospital, but to the provincial hospital. The, uh, the, the institutional organizational principle of this is that provinces paid for the Medicare, the federal government was responsible for First Nations people. Same as, as, uh, as uh, reserve schooling, say, these days. Okay, so one interesting thing is we've got the sanatorium movement. And because the federal government funded the construction of Fort San, First Nations people were allowed to go. That said, okay, uh, that, you know, and this was celebrated for a long time, but there's a changing interpretation of, of the treatment of indigenous people at Fort San. You can see here, and again, I cut and pasted this from a couple years ago, Former Indian hospital patients launched class action lawsuit. You see Tony Merchant, I don't know if you guys, newcomers to town, Tony Merchant likes to get people organized into class action lawsuits. But, okay, there are enough people to have organized a class action lawsuit. And I
pay. In fact, okay, they just keep coming. This is basically the organization of a class action lawsuit uh, from a community around Igloolik, so Inuit community in the, in the high Arctic, where skin grafting experiments were undertaken in the 60s and 70s without the people's permission. So you can see this guy saying, I'm not a monkey. And uh, this uh, Lazari Utak, I was grafted with part of the skin of my sister. So there's a, basically a you know, medical researcher cutting and pasting skin on people from the community for some kind of scientific reason, okay? Also, okay, like, I apologize, I'm like laying it on you, but like this is part of the deal, okay? This is a, a demonstration in support of the family of Joy Eshaquan, and you can see here, there, there was just a report after her death. Ms. Eshaquan had the presence of mind to record with her iPhone her death as health workers were heaping racial abuse on her. Okay. Had that not happened, had she not recorded, we'd never know about it. Anyhow, there was a, not surprisingly, there was a commission. And Premier Legault, okay, I don't want to minimize the suffering, that's what's important that it stops. But it's not institutional racism, it's a few bad apples, right? So, we've got Joyce Eshaquan, we've got Brian Sinclair. Now, to his credit, Premier Mo has acknowledged that there is institutional racism. Okay, so like he, the tubal ligations, you can't really deny those. But having admits, you know, like admitting there's an issue and acting upon it, I guess are two different things. This is Jason Mercury from Prairie Harm Reduction. And for two years, Jason asked for $1.3 million, basically to keep drug users alive in Saskatoon. Like we've just broken a record, shattered a record of, of drug overdose deaths. Jason is not trying to proselytize, he's trying to keep people alive. Last year, he came to, zoomed into my health studies class, they were selling t-shirts and accepting donations, basically, to keep this thing going because they had no provincial support. As this is going on, the government decided to spend $120 million expanding the remand center in Saskatoon. So rather than, actually I made a joke one time, couldn't they spend $117 million on the remand center? Maybe throw a bone to the harm reduction? Anyhow, this is just from a few weeks ago, and you can see that community-based organizations are like, why are you putting the screws on even tighter on the indigenous community when you could actually be, you know, moving it forward? Now, this is a like, true tale of woe, okay? There are some, oh, there are some bright spots. This is Dr. Alika Lafontaine. He's the president-elect of the Canadian Medical Association. Very activist, like he's gonna make some changes. But I guess I want you guys to remember that President Obama didn't eliminate racism in the United States, right? So this is, a, this is for sure a, you know, like a positive, uh, uh, a positive event. Uh, but, okay, both of these slides are a little out of date. I gotta get new ones. I want you guys to think about something, okay? So we've got Dr. Lafontaine is, is president-elect of the Canadian Medical Association. Awesome. Every day, Saskatchewan becomes more and more indigenous. Right now, we're probably at, so we're just under 20, probably 17, 18% First Nations and Métis. Okay, so that's a huge percentage of our population, especially if you guys think about how, how potentially vulnerable that population is to a whole bunch of different things. This image on the right is from mclean's.ca, and what they did was they did a study of power and race in, Sa in Saskatchewan. Okay, and you can see here mayors, zero indigenous, councillors, MPs, zero now, okay? And there are a couple more indigenous judges. But I'm putting this up because we've got, you know, like an ever-growing indigenous population. We're not getting much change at the top. And really, <laughs> the only time we're gonna get improvements in some of these things is, is if we get more representation just about at every level of, uh, uh, of service provider, like you know, our students, medical professionals. Now, I think this is my last slide, or just about my last slide, okay? One of the things that has happened, well, has happened to me, and I'm sitting at my desk and things kind of cross it, is rather than people studying indigenous issues, one of the, one of the current trends in scholarship is actually studying the scientists, us, like people looking at our, at our legacy as, as uh, health researchers, as, as medical providers. So and I, I probably shouldn't 
uh, quote a book that isn't published yet, but I was a, a, a peer reviewer of a book. I thought this was a pretty good quote from Dr. Mukapte. Too much time being studied uh, like on the disease, okay? Like what is the etiology of diabetes? Well, what it really is, is food security and poverty. So we're spending tons of money on research when we actually kind of know what, you know, like we know this is what diagnosing the legacy is. We know what the answers are, but we haven't, we haven't crossed that threshold into action, like, you know. Uh, this is another one. Uh, uh, what can I say? Super interesting and infuriating at the same time. And basically what it is, is in 2010, okay, in the aftermath of, you know, the Human Genome Project, everything has a genetic explanation. Few people, like a team of researchers looking at Sandy Lake, northwestern Ontario, extremely high rate of diabetes, identified what they thought was a gene. So it's like, oh, this is the thrifty gene. Now the idea of this is, in the olden days, indigenous, like this is the interpretation, okay? In the olden days, indigenous people endured periods of feast and periods of famine, okay? So in modern times, when we don't have any famines, those feasts, like, you know, like there is a constant level of feast. Therefore, that's why we've got obesity and that's why we've got diabetes. It's a pretty simple explanation, except it's not true, okay? So what it is, again, is food security and it's we scientists, like we people, in, you know, researchers, are looking for the simple answers which don't necessarily change the social relations. I guess that's one way to think about this. And uh, I don't have a slide on my friend Ian Mosby's work. His, his article, Administering Colonial Science, really blow the, blew the lid on this. And this was basically an examination of, of nutritional experiments at medical schools, right? So he's, he was probably the, the pioneer in this whole field. And that was front page news a few years ago. Uh, this is really my last slide, okay? Uh, we should all kind of be aware of, I guess, you know, the, the truth and reconciliation calls to action. You can see current health, direct result, previous policies, residential schools. But it, I think it's for all of us, and especially those of us, you know, like we are supported by the state, right? Like in our work and our grants and that kind of thing. But from my perspective, like a lot of times we know what the answers are. We don't necessarily need to, to continue on that path. What we gotta do is we gotta start pushing people to start basically responding to, uh, to those issues. So with that, I think I'll stop. I've probably spoken for too long. Uh, Thanks for listening to me. Did anybody have any questions, comments? Oh, <laughs> oh so my punchline, okay, I forgot my punchline, sorry, Adriana, okay. My punchline, you know, from the start is like, why don't people get vaccinated, okay? Because we've got some communities only have 50, 55% vaccination. With all of these insane social relationships with the state, I'm kind of surprised in some of those communities that they've got such high vaccination rates because there is literally no trust, there, there is no faith in like the government or the institutions or you know, the, the medical industrial complex, whatever it might be. So like I said, we got to build trust before we can really be, be effective at what we do, if, what, if that's what is required, because maybe we're not even doing the right thing. Anyhow, now I'm done. Would you mind giving the mic to, to my, my friend and colleague, Ken? Okay, so this, is, this has been coming up. This is Ken Wilson, PhD student in MAP. Ken, would you mind sharing that story about, uh, you know, when you were getting organized with the, um, I think it was a play or was it an art gallery and you had the indigenous person on, your, uh, on the committee? Oh, yeah, that's happening in the story. Oh, okay.
Yeah, and it's almost talking at cross purposes, like, hey, get vaccinated, it's good for you. It's like, yeah, you told, you, you told my ancestors that 10 times and look what happened to them, right? So, um, yeah, like, there's, this is really exposed, I don't know, the, the gap in trust, I guess. Like, you know, like, we've got a health crisis that's been going on for two years, and, and people just aren't biting. And it's not because, you know, like, it's not like the people who are on the internet talking about, you know, like, the magnets and the, like, it's a different thing. Like, there, I'm sure there are some people who are victims to misinformation, but what it is, they just don't trust Whitey. Yeah, actually, uh, I was going to put that on. Uh, Dr. Lafontaine won an NSERC undergrad scholarship while he was at U, at U of R. So it's interesting. We should be putting him on the poster somewhere, but that's another story. Yeah. The Hudson's Bay Company did a selectively better job. One of the things that would have complicated my talk, I told you guys about that 17, uh, 1837 epidemic on the Missouri River. Another manifestation of that was actually at Fort Simpson on the northern border. It's uh, Port Rupert right now, okay? Like it's in that territory. 12,000 people got sick around there, Simpson people and northerners playing it in that. And the physician fur trader vaccinated his family. He had vaccine because he wrote in the book, he vaccinated his family, and he vaccinated, in those days, white guys, it was all white guys, would marry indigenous women to, to be locked into the social system, like literally you're, you're marrying into the fur trade family. He vaccinated his father-in-law, who was the preferred trader. So two other high-end, they were called legates, the two other high-end chiefs died during the epidemic, making his father-in-law and the preferred trader kind of like the supreme leader of, of those uh, Simpson people. So they could. But again, Dr. Todd asked for a raise for saving several thousand people, and, and the people in London said no. Like, that's just part of your job. So, uh, you know, like in my earlier work, I just kind of bit into the, you know, the, the vision of benevolence or humanity or whatever, but I think it was really tempered by, um, I don't know, by business interest. Yeah, but like I said, I think in the past, people knew the value of vaccine. Like, you know, like, we're, we're buying into it. Like, this disease is coming. Those guys have the, have the medicine for it. I'm going to take it. But these days, like, in modern times, there's just been so much, so many things that have undermined that trust that it's kind of like I teach health studies. And one of, the, one of the issues we brought up, we were talking about in class one day, was organ donation. Okay? Like, and it's like, oh, how do we get indigenous people to to bite into organ donation, because it's not, like, it's just not happening. And so one of the students went back to Prince Albert. She, she was from Wapaton, so she's Dakota, okay? And she talked to the elders, and, and she came back, she said, um, organ donation is just not our way. So like, I, you know, like, I, we're, I'm trying to think of angles, like, how can we do something culturally appropriate? And basically, it's like, we don't, like, we just don't want an organ, like, you know, like, we'll choose the other. I don't want to speak for everybody, but like, that's what my student kind of uh, represented from the people she talked to. So I guess it was kind of a, I don't know if it's fatalism, but like, you know, that heroic cancer fight or whatever it is that we kind of, uh, I don't know if we idealize it, but you know, like we sort of see that in our society might be a different thing.
Okay. Well, one uh, good question, okay, that's going to be a long-term thing, right? So what we got to do is we got to get more indigenous students through high school who can come to U of R to take our courses or to take other courses in order to be a representative workplace in the healthcare system. Because if you had an indigenous physician or nurse at Joyce Sesequan's death, I can guarantee you there wouldn't have been that kind of thing. It's kind of, but it's the same as, I don't know, policing or probably any other, like if you get a diverse, rep, and it's like the government calls it a representative workforce. If you've got 17 or 18% of your population is indigenous, you should be sh striving for those goals and attaining those goals. And at least what you'll have is people moderating whatever assumptions those of us who aren't indigenous to have, you know, hey, like tune you in if you're, if you're going the wrong way. So, uh, it's been going on for generations. It's probably going to take, you know, a generation or two, even if we're successful. But I don't know what the numbers are, but even in the 12 years I've been working here, we have a much larger Indigenous student population than we did 10 years ago, right? So things are changing. Oh, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, we'll get to oh yeah.